And there were some really great questions in our community today that I wanted to address. Uh, and they were really great. And it was regarding self, it's regarding trust in relationships. <laughs> Hey, good evening. Well, it's evening here now, whatever you are in this beautiful planet watching on replay. If you're watching on replay, give me a hashtag replay. I just decided to go live and answer some questions. It has been a while since I have um, really had the bandwidth, uh, the energy uh, to, and, and inspiration. I my my. My commitment is that when I do these Facebook Lives or these these videos or recordings for podcasts that I don't do it unless I really feel inspired to do it. And there were some really great questions in our community today that I wanted to address. Uh, and they were really great. And it was regarding self, it's regarding trust in relationships. And because the questions were so good, um, I thought, hey, I feel inspired to share, but my son's asleep now. Uh, the day is done, and I it's just you and just me and this microphone and this camera, and this is where I really love to, to give my gift. And uh, if you've never met me before and you're new to the community, welcome. My name is Dr. Nima Romani. I'm a retired chiropractor, and I retired from chiropractic because I discovered that there was something missing uh, in people's kind of health journey, that all of the external things, whether it be they're taking medications, vitamins, all the smoothies and everything, and also the adjustments that I was giving them, with certain types of chronic conditions, there was a missing link that was preventing them from healing. And oftentimes, what I realized is they were stuck in a relational cycle a breakdown in a relationship that was really keeping them from feeling at their best uh it was causing depression anxiety uh digestive problems chronic pains and when i traced it back you know if you've been doing something for 20 years you start to get good at it you start to find um little little patterns with people you get this intuitive sense like after 20 years when a patient is laying on my table i'm i'm not thinking my my hands are actually doing the thinking for me and so uh there's an intuitive sense that comes through in your craft when you've been doing it for a while and, and for me i noticed that there's a direct correlation between these chronic conditions especially chronic pain chronic conditions, chronic digestive disorders, chronic um, thyroid issues, uh, long-term kind of pain syndromes, and codependency. <laughs> I know that sounds weird, but I saw a personality kind of alignment. It's just somebody who said, oh, I have fibromyalgia. It's almost as though I could literally profile their personality type. And usually it's kind of like doormat type of people. And I don't mean this in a disrespectful way. I just mean it in a sense of there was this pattern I saw that the physiology speaks up for us when we don't really know or we've been conditioned to suppress speaking up for ourselves. So the body speaks up for us when we don't speak up for ourselves. So the question that makes sense to ask is why don't we speak up for ourselves? And the answer is very simple when you look at the, in the field of the polyvagal theory and attachment theory, uh, which is that it's, it's in our conditioning. You know, what did it cost you as a child to speak up and say what your values were, or what your desires were, or what you wanted? What did it cost you? Did it cost you punishment to have big emotions and, and, and desires and, 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 uh, 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 to, to speak up, to voice your, to, to, to speak or use your voice, you know? So we then condition ourselves. We then become conditioned through our conditioning, through no fault of our own to suppress ourselves, to suppress our anger, 
you know, that the experience of not feeling seen by your mother, uh, by your parents, that feeling of abandonment is very anger producing to a child. You know, I have a two year old almost, he's almost two. You can see him like he gets angry when he doesn't get his way. Right. Well, imagine not feeling, you know, being five and six and seven and eight years old. And because of the chaos that's happening in your parents' relationship, because of maybe a divorce or maybe there's some abuse going on, there's this inner anger that a child experiences for not feeling seen. But it doesn't feel safe to express that anger because it, if it will result in the child having a withdrawal of love and approval, well, then that's not safe. So it just feels safer to just kind of suppress it. Or if you've ever been told, you know, don't cry or I'll give you something to cry about, or you had a really traumatic experience, but it was invalidated, or you were told that, you know, it's not, it, it didn't, um, uh, that it, it, it didn't happen, or you should be grateful. This conditioning, the child doesn't doesn't learn to hate the parent as a child. The child learns to d abandon and and hate themselves. Self hate becomes a form of self protection in environments where we don't feel seen and understood by our caregivers. And this is uh, probably the real pandemic: emotional neglect, emotional abuse, and so this causes us to then create adaptive behaviors to then compensate for this feeling of not feeling seen and heard. And so we then become doormats. We then start people pleasing. We then start to create these false selves, these masks that we put on, whatever it takes to feel worthiness and, and approval and love, whatever it takes, I'll be whoever I need to be loved even though if it's an environment where it's a strict religious upbringing or you had religious trauma, well, okay, I'm a devout Christian then. If whatever you say, that means that I'm going to go to heaven or I'm worthy of love. And I don't mean to um, be a detractor for any of your faiths. I'm just talking about the experiences of our students in our cycle breakers community, many of whom experience religious trauma, all meaning well. You know, the faith and the religion that we're raised in has a very... Uh, positive um, intent, which is to live a good life, right? And so oftentimes this good intent, well-intentioned parenting, which is very behavioral kind of uh, behavioristic and, you know, we got to make sure the kids behave, children are to be seen and not heard, spare the rod, spoil the child. It's all designed to have a child behave in a certain way, which is basically like conditioning. And it kind of, it robs us of our sovereignty and our free will and our power and our freedom and our self-expression. And so we learn to abandon ourselves. We learn to give up our best interests uh, to in order to help meet our needs, which becomes our best interests. If I can meet my own needs by abandoning my own needs and then becoming really good at pleasing or rescuing or, you know, abandoning myself in service of getting approval, creating a false self, uh, getting approval from the one or the many. And welcome to the foundational blueprint of codependency, the foundational blueprint of trauma bonding. Because what will happen unconsciously is... This incomplete that we experience in childhood, we will seek to resolve through uh, our intimate partnerships. And so we have this compulsion to reenact the trauma. If you felt betrayed constantly by your father or your mother, you saw that happening, that's in your system. Not that it's your fault. Of course, none of this is your fault. It's your conditioning. You will be called on to be pulled towards relationships, which then put you in positions where you're feeling betrayed. Again, not your fault. <laughs> There's a huge distinction between fault and taking responsibility. So fault means it was your fault, you're the one to blame, and that's not what I'm saying at all. Responsibility is, this isn't your fault. There's no one to blame. This was part of your parents' conditioning. Okay, that being said, 
this conditioning has resulted in the relationship choices that you've had thus far, the people who you have chosen didn't happen by accident. It didn't get together by chance. You didn't make a mistake. It was part of your conditioning. None of it's your fault. And yet, on the second half of the journey in our lives, how do we want to have it? Do we want to keep repeating the same pattern? Or are we ready to learn the skills and the tools to be able to co-create relationships, career, health, uh, from a place of, um, you know, healing, from a place of empowerment, in an ascension, in a conscious way. And that's really what this this whole community is really about. It's, it's I call it, we call in our programs and everything, called the Cycle Breakers Collective, because these are people who have recognized these patterns that don't take, you know, have maybe blamed themselves all their lives, have realized none of this is your fault, but I putting their hand up, I'm ready to take responsibility to break that cycle for myself, for my children, for my family, because they're now starting to exhibit the same patterns and I don't want them to have the same relational patterns. In my life, it took me one divorce and nine, eight or nine failed relationships finally to a really abusive situation where we were both very abusive to one another and just were blinded by the shared fantasy that we had. And we just kept going through this cycle of abuse again and again. And I didn't really understand it because I was, you know, in my head and cognitively, I thought I had a, a handle on it. But I didn't realize at the time that there was unresolved attachment trauma in my body. And so my work was my, you know, I stopped working for a while and I went inside and I healed. I worked towards healing that. I don't want to use the word, word healing as the past tense because I do believe that healing is an ongoing process. It's a skill that we can learn and acquire that nobody's actually taught us that usually we delegated that to other people like coaches and counselors and therapists and doctors and psychiatrists. Whereas none of those people can do that healing work for us. It's all about us learning how to rescue ourselves. I learned how to do that. And I put together a formula that didn't exist out there. And I put it all together in one kind of model. And this, the path to being a cycle breaker, the trigger proof process was born. And as a result of that, I was able to, at the age of 44... I thought something I would never be able to do was able to now find a secure partnership and then feel a sense of trust within myself. And that was what I never had before. It wasn't that I didn't trust that I would be able to find somebody. I was more of the avoidant attachment style. It was me that I didn't trust. I didn't trust myself to be in a relationship because what if I get... What if I get, you know, tired of this person? What if I have to go through another divorce? What do I have to go through another failed relationship? I don't want to do this anymore. It just feels safer to just fucking give up. I'm so sick of this bullshit. And number one, number two, why is my twin brother, why did he not have the same problem? He has a healthy relationship. His dental practice is doing great. He doesn't have all of these same anxieties and crises. Why is it that we're twins and he's, you know, doesn't have the same issue as me. Well, part of my inward journey was discovering what that was. And what I discovered was that at the age of two, when my mother and father were exploring immigrating from Iran to Canada, my mother had to come to Canada by herself because my dad was working. And we had twins, me and my twin brother. Who's she going to take? She took the more difficult child, which was my brother, and left the easier one with grandma. So for three months, I was not with my mother. Now, I don't remember it because it was before I was really verbal, but it was around the age of my son. Now, he's 20, at the recording of this, he's 23 months old, 22, 23 months, almost 23 months old, almost two years old. And when my wife just goes to the car to get something or goes outside or has to go outside and leave him for like five minutes he freaks out it's like mommy where's mommy well i just see him and i see the way he's reacting and what happens to his system and the panic that he goes through when mommy's not there and then i think back to myself 
at the age of two where my mummy wasn't there for three months and I didn't understand it and no rational explanation could really soothe me. And it all makes sense now because of that attachment trauma. That's a separation is a form of trauma. It's actually a very traumatic to a, to, to the nervous system of a child. And because of that trauma, my system, my, the, the blueprint of my nervous system and safety and consistency and attachment and secure attachment was broken in my system, which then informed the type of partners that I would merge with and what would get activated or triggered in relational dynamics. And that fear of abandonment was so paralyzing that I deliberately would choose partners that I knew would never leave. There was a, you know, kind of like a discrepancy in empowerment. So I would deliberately choose partners that I knew that I didn't have to worry about them leaving. So it wasn't based on me feeling um, inspired by this person. It was somebody who was more disempowered in different areas of life than I was, so I didn't have to worry that, you know, I would have to leave. So naturally, the short term, that created a sense of safety for my system. But in the long term, it created a disempowerment dynamic. So it created a codependency. I literally would be creating a codependency type of situation and finding myself in the narcissist codependent cycle. And it wasn't until my wake up call in my last relationship when things got abusive between both of us, we were abusive to one another. There was emotional abuse, there was physical abuse. There was, it, you know, it was, um, it was really like a wake up call. And I had to ask, how did this happen? How do I make sure that this never happens again in my life so that I can have secure relationships? And if I can do number one and number two, I really want to help change the world with it by sharing my story with vulnerability and with, with uh, transparency. And so here we are. And we're in this conversation and we had this, this, this great question from uh, Michelle in the group and I'm going to read it and I want to answer it for you. She says that I feel that I'm having trust issues now that I have lost the one person I actually thought trusted me and didn't to work through our issues. I would have loved to work with her in her struggles to figure out that she wasn't well with me. I would have let her go and understood this if she had shared her struggles and process with me, which I don't really believe to be true. Um, <laughs> say, oh, the fantasy is, oh, if she told me earlier then, you know, when you say that, when we say, we expect, why didn't they tell me earlier what their problems were? It's, you know, it's very, very, um, uh, it's when we don't really understand the nature of emotional safety. Some people don't feel safe. They feel, most people feel incredibly ashamed of their issues. So it takes a certain person to have done some in, internal work to have a, a degree of internal safety to be, sh to be able to share vulnerably and transparently. I mean, I'm talking into a camera right now, into a microphone, blasting this out into social media. Um, I wouldn't have been able to have the courage to be really transparent with my challenges unless I've done some deep inner work, right? So most people don't do that. And sorry, talking to a counselor or a therapist each week and venting is not deep inner work. Let me say that again. Talking to a therapist or a counselor every week is not deep inner work. A lot of our students in our programs say, wow, I realized I was avoiding the work by doc talking to the counselor. And so I'll talk a little bit more about that and what the distinction, actually I have tons of content. Um, what I'm gonna invite you to do is go on YouTube and watch um, what you need to understand about trauma in order to heal it. It's my video entitled, What You Need to Understand About Trauma in Order to Heal It. Please watch that and I share the distinction of how talk therapy does not get to the root cause. We have got to go beyond the story into the, into the uh, stored survival stress in order to actually heal. 
So let me say, I would have loved to work with her in with her in her struggles to figure out that she wasn't well with me. I would have let her go and understood this if she had shared her struggles and process with me. Now that she has left me in the dark, abandonment wound, by the way, um, left me in the dark. You know, it's this is the, the language. You got to listen to language whenever you're working with trauma because. The, the language is the voice of the unconscious and the words we choose are very, very interesting. Uh, I feel I'm not trustworthy. I feel like everything is fake and that everyone is just fake and that has to be to each his own. There's an element of truth to that, by the way, Michelle. Um, if you haven't done your inner work and you're in a state of uh, scarcity, of love, of, of resources, then we do put on masks. Essentially, most of what we see out there, especially in social media, you can really see it. Everybody's wearing a mask. You can tell in the tone of voice in somebody, in their body language, facial expressions, their, you know, saccharineness, like extreme positivity, fake positivity. Everybody's fucking fake. Literally, most people are. And uh, the people in, in our Cycle Breakers community, they say, wow, like I can't date people who haven't done their inner work because you can actually feel it in someone when they've actually embodied the work that they, the inner work. Now that she's left me in the dark, I feel I'm not trustworthy. I feel like everything is fake and that everyone is just fake and that it has to be each his own. How am I supposed to trust myself again to actually know that I'm not getting involved with someone new just from a trauma issue i think what she means is from a place of like an attachment trauma for for like a co compensating for trauma right how do i know that i'm not just compensating for trauma by how do i in other words how do i know this isn't just a trauma bond right i feel i'm well aware of my issues i've worked on some of them i always wonder when someone says i've worked on some of them whenever somebody says I, i'm working on myself they'll dm me i'm working on myself like, okay, I'm always wondering at to what degree are you working on yourself? If, if you're talking about it, that is good work. Maybe even reading some books, maybe even watching some YouTube videos, but I'm working on myself after I've done, after, you know, being in this field for a while, I get really, I kind of get little spider senses start to tingle when somebody tells me, oh, I'm working on myself. I'm like, really? What, what work are you doing? Oh, I'm reading some books. I watch your YouTube videos. Eh. That's helpful. That's information. But there's a difference between information and transformation. Transformation, you got it's got to be in the body. You got to be challenged, right? And most people don't want to be challenged. They just want you know, comfort and ease and healing our attachment wounds is anything but comfortable. It's actually quite the opposite. So how am I supposed to trust myself again to actually know that I'm not getting involved with someone new just from a trauma issue or a trauma bond is what she means. I feel I'm well aware of my issues. I've worked on some of them and now I just feel like I'll just fall back into some of them and I guess patterns is what she means and that this is what will bring us together anyway. So what do I do? Please note that I'm not looking to be in a relationship right now. Not sure I ever will be notice the language it's just dismissive and kind of like hopeless and you can feel the um the resignation it's just like oh just i just never gonna just don't want to be bothered by the way i've been there um please note that i'm not looking to be in a relationship right now not sure i ever will be just that i think of it sometimes and always come back to What's the point if we always get together from a trauma issue? In other words, trauma bond. Great question. What's the point? If we're just going to get together because of trauma bonding, then, then what, what's the actual, what is the actual point of getting into the relationship in the first place? So how do I, in other words, how do I build trust again in relationships, in myself, in other people. And so I really wanted to address that. Uh, the three, three steps, basically three steps. It's just, I'm making it sound so simple. It's really not, but this is the path of the being a cycle breaker that we take people through in our, in our, um, programs. And this is what I had to go through to go from exactly where you were, Michelle going, fuck, relationships altogether. I just don't even want to be bothered to 
I really trust myself. I trust myself when I travel. I trust myself because I, I'm all in and I get it now. And here's basically how I'm going to use my little um, instrument here and I'm going to go over the three steps. Let's see, I'm going to move it here. And the first one here, I'm going to write down here on my little iPad. The first one, can you see that? Okay, great. How to build trust so that you can feel safe in relationships again, even though, you know, trauma is going to be, trauma bonding likely uh, could be, if you don't do the work often, often, that love at first sight, oh, I feel like I've known you all my life. There's something so familiar about you. This just boom, love at first sight, trauma bond type of experience. Um how do we make sure that the relationship is built with security and stability? And the first one, uh, building trust to build, how to build trust, basically, the first step is to master, to answer your question, here's what you're gonna do. You're gonna master your nervous system. got to master your nervous system. You got to become, learn how to become an active operator of your nervous system. You got to understand the variant. This is part of our trainings that we take everybody through. It's like module number one. In order to build trust again, Michelle, we have to actually get to a place where we understand and we build a new relationship with ourselves, starting with the nervous system. Do you understand and are able to feel and sense when you're in fight or flight and sympathetic? That's easy to do. Can you assess and understand when you're in what's called dorsal freeze, where you've checked out, you've left your body, your emotions are too big, too fast, too soon, and it's just such a threat that you just dissociate. They call it depersonalization, derealization. Some places call it depression. It isn't. It's not depression. It's just, I get it. I've been depressed before, so I understand. Clinically, it's not an entity caused by um, uh, a chemical imbalance. That's bullshit. It's your nervous system feeling like it's under attack, and it's a totally protective mechanism. But if you don't understand it and you don't learn how to master your nervous system, you're going to have a distortion you're gonna you're you're not gonna be able to you're gonna mislabel you're not gonna understand your 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 feelings you're gonna mislabel them you're going to um have a distortion with them you're going to it's called cognitive distortion cognitive mislabeling you know what'll happen is you get all of these big emotions and they're like highly addictive chemicals of those relations relational dynamics and you're like, oh my God, and you have orgasms and you're like, oh my God, this must be love. Not necessarily, it's not love. It's actually this high intensity of emotional uh, activity that you don't know how to regulate and you just mislabel it as love. This is what I was doing. And when you get this part right and you master the nervous system, you're able to have impulse control. You're able to self-regulate. And if you're able to self-regulate, you don't need an external person to regulate. You don't have to outsource your regulation to somebody else. If you have to outsource your regulation to somebody else, fix it. Fix my emotions. You then revert to a childlike state. You then need a mommy or a daddy to fix it. And now you've entered a trauma-bonded situation because you haven't learned to master your nervous system. This is the first most critical element of building trust. Does that make sense? So my invitation for you as you're listening is to really give yourself a self-assessment on a scale of one to 10. How well do you understand your nervous system, you understand your state, and you have an ability to know exactly what to do when your state is in a certain way to move up the ladder to create safety internally. If you learn that skill, Michelle, Self-trust just builds. It automatically shows up because you know that, hey, no matter what happens through conflict, I trust myself because I don't need somebody else to regulate for me.
Does that make sense? So that's how you build trust. Now, I'm not saying it's easy. I'm not saying it's gonna happen overnight. I'm not saying that you can actually do it from reading a book. You can't, you can learn. Of course, content is important, but this is an actually embodied practice that it takes showing up. Like this is like, you can't learn this from a book any more than you can learn um, Taekwondo from reading a book. You actually have to register, show up on the mat and go through the motions and have you know, feedback. That's the way you learn, but it's probably the most critical skill because if we don't learn this, then we then pass that lack of awareness onto our kids. But if you learn this, how to master your nervous system, you can then teach your children and break that cycle. Hence the term cycle breaker. The reason why you don't know how to master your nervous system is because you were raised by parents who didn't know what the fuck to do with their own. And guess what? You're now passing that on to your kids. So this is really important. This is not for the faint of heart, but it's for people who are like, I'm ready to do this. I'm ready to break the cycle. Number two, you got to learn how to heal attachment wounds. So I could see by your share how painful this last relationship breakdown was to the point where you're like, fuck this, I never want to do it again. Well, you're dealing with an attachment trauma. And I want you to imagine it like, um, like, um, like a muscle, or any type of string, or let's say an elastic, you have an attachment. And with this attachment, it's been broken, it's been ruptured, it's been broken. And that that break leaves a scar leaves a wound. Now, if you're really honest, if you look back through your life, you've been accumulating these attachment wounds since you were a child, starting with the attachment wound from your parent, right? I didn't realize I was holding on to attachment wounds in my body at the age of, since the age of two. Now, I wasn't consciously aware of it because most of our attachment wounds happen when we were pre-verbal. So if you were given up for an if you were given up for adoption, there is a deep attachment wound there. If you were born in a scenario where your parents, it was like a situation where you weren't really, you didn't really have an invitation to exist. And it was just kind of like, okay, we're going to have this kid and it's an inconvenience. You were constantly made to feel like an inconvenience that is an attachment wound to the child. The child feels it. You don't believe me. Come check out my two, two, two year old. He can sense our emotions. He can feel it. He can sense it. You know, when, when his mother is crying, she's having a sad moment. She, he walks up, he can see it. He just, he reacts He's like, hi, hi. He just, he doesn't, he doesn't do that great when he sees mommy sad. Like it brings up his own, uh, woundings, right? So our attachment wounds, we've been accumulating them since we were children. And just by talking them through, we're not going to heal them because we got to heal them at a body-based level. Got to understand the polyvagal theory, which I was talking about with the nervous system. We got to understand the neuroscience of attachment and then heal with the shadow parts. This is where our shadows, integrated shadows, our wounded child is just part of our shadow. This is really important to re repair with that younger part of us. And when we do, all of a sudden, this breakdown in the relationship that we've been carrying like rocks in our backpack, we're able to let these rocks go. When if you don't do this, you're just bringing one attachment trauma with you into the next relationship. And guaranteed, Michelle, you're going to bring that wounding to your next relationship. And then it just keeps accumulating. And that's why my relationships were actually getting worse and worse as the time was going. They actually amplify, right? It's pretty, pretty fucked up. <laughs> but the good news is it can be resolved with the right guide and the right community. And the third one is you got to learn the art of repair. The word is repair. So notice the language, attachment, okay? Rupture, argument, breakdown. And then there's a way to repair. 
when you have conflict, you know, what's your relationship with conflict itself? Oh, I avoid conflict. Oh, I just stuff down. Or I'm just constantly poking and conflicting, right? So, oh, I just, I just avoid it altogether. Well, that conflict, external conflict that you're avoiding is an opportunity to actually get stronger. Once you heal those attachment wounds and you learn the art of repairing from ruptures, you then build trust. You build a sense of safety within yourself. See, I trust my relationship, myself in this relationship, because I know that while we're two imperfect human beings trying to figure it out and we get into arguments and we get into conflict, I always know, and she knows as well, we're both committed to repair, to the repair. And repair is a funny thing, is that if you learn this art of repair, every breakdown or rupture or argument that you have, when you repair it, it's like a muscle. If you build a muscle, if you go to the gym and you're building, you're doing... Um, bicep curls, what's happening is you're causing little mini micro rupturing or tearing that happens in the muscle fiber, which then results in the body adapting to repair and the muscle starts to become stronger. So in other words, I look at my relationship now, we've been married for two years, we've been together for three years. Our relationship is stronger now because of the conflicts that we've gone through and repaired so each time, trust keeps building. So the relationship, intimacy, what's available to you when you really learn this, intimacy, uh, trust, security, grows and expands with time rather than what trauma bonds are, which is this amazing first few months, which is like, like an addictive high of the honeymoon phase that eventually starts to decompose and decompensate into an abusive mess where there's infidelity, there's uh, abuse, there's all sorts of shit. And you're like, wow, like who is this person? I don't even want to be with this person because there's such a wall between us. You know, these skills are what build self-trust. This is exactly what we teach in our Cycle Breakers community. And this is really the, the, the path moving forward to, to get to that. I think I, I think I might have. There we go. So healing, mastering your nervous system, healing our attachment wounds, and learning the art of repair. Now, I'm sorry to give you this the news that it's to get to that place of self, of trust isn't just like a pie in the sky thing that's going to show up without some effort. It's going to take some effort. It's not going to be easy. It's going to take work. It's like building muscle. I want you to start to see this concept of self-love or trust within a relationship as a muscle that builds over time with the right guidance, with the right application, with the right tools, with the right strategy, with the right guidance, and through conflict. So if you can't handle or stomach conflict or you can't confront it or you're afraid of it, well then obviously you're not going to have trust. You're not going to build trust. If you don't know how to identify, self-assess, and self-regulate your nervous system, of course you're not going to have trust. If you don't have, if you haven't healed those attachment wounds that you've accumulated throughout your life, it's kind of like this storage, like you have like a, a, a storage or a, an attic with all these storage containers of all your past memories and everything, and it's just all a mess and it's completely disorganized. Well, this is what you're carrying with you like rocks in a backpack. So the journey up the mountain of life, which is a climb, really it's, a, you know, we have to identify why are we here? We gotta, and by, by the way, healing your trauma really involves a, like that's why going to a psychiatrist isn't going to help uh, because, I mean, talking to someone always helps, but uh, really to, to, to resolve it, we really have to identify uh, uh, our, our spiritual philosophy of really what life is, why we're here. I'm here to 
uh, learn from all of my previous uh, woundings, my my ruptures, my unconscious conditioning, and to awaken so that I can then heal and feel safe in my body and learn the skills necessary on this second half of my journey to really live an amazing experience, to have a create amazing experience in my life. And the only way that I can do that is by having healthy, secure relationships. It's I thought it was to have a lot of money. I thought it was to have attention from uh, women. I got those things and it didn't quite fill the void. And I realized, number one, to build self-trust and self-love is my number one focus so that then I can go from a place of overflow and then create that in my community uh, with other relationships and create relationships with my students, my friends, my family that feel safe, that I can become a safe container. Uh, if we don't do that, then we'll dismiss it and say, oh, fuck this relationship stuff. And then try to convince myself that I'm just better off alone when, when in fact, really deeply we crave connection. And the truth is, is that we need one another. People suck a lot of the time. We're at the effect of our unconscious conditioning, but yet on the other side of it, we need people. So that's what this community is about. Hopefully that um, was helpful to answer Brandy's question uh, about emotional regulation after being triggered. This kind of like goes along with the conversation about nervous system regulation. How do you know if you felt an emotion and move through it or, uh, it's, or you've just had it suppressed and, and stored? How do you know? Um, anytime I'm feeling anxious, I'm feeling a sense of alarm, it's because I have an unresolved emotion going on. There's a sadness, there's an anger, there's a guilt, there's a shame that I haven't really moved through. And the how do we know is usually through tears. We know because there's a release. Um, if we, most of the time, because we don't know how to feel, because we haven't learned the steps, we haven't done the work, um, we will compartmentalize those emotions and push them away. And how do you know that you're pushing it away? You feel checked out. You feel like you're avoiding emotions. And by avoiding emotions, that's when anxiety comes up. Anxiety is a distraction from an emotion that you're not seeing or feeling because it's too painful or you haven't learned how. And so the answer to your question is, you know, because there's an emotion, there's tears that come up, there's an expression, there's a movement of energy through tears, through laughter, through a yawn. And we cover that all in our breath work and our overview experience. And we teach people the foundational steps. So the invitation, if you're listening and you are in a place where you're not feeling a sense of trust and you're realizing that life is not worth it if trust isn't built and you're curious and you're ready to to learn the invitation is for you to apply that there's an application process where we interview you to see if you're ready to break that cycle you're ready to make your own healing a priority you don't need anyone's permission you're ready to do it this is a priority you want to break that cycle i'm going to leave a link there uh for you to apply there's an application process you fill out you let us know really what's going on and where you're at and where you'd love to be and then from your answers we kind of put together a little bit of a uh, a process a formula so that you can then have the best kind of op option for where you're at right now and so we've refined our our discovery call process after interviewing over a thousand people we know who are who's the right fit for us and who isn't and who who's living in fantasy land if you got to be um 100 um ready to take responsibility not blame you got to be um willing to show up do the work um and not look for rescuers outside of you in other words Nima's not a guru i'm not a guru uh, nobody's above you. I'm on my own path. We're guides and you're ready to learn how to be guided to self-trust. And so if you're ready or um, I'm going to leave a link. Uh, if you're not ready for that, you just want to kind of dip your toe in. Our next breathwork and badassery is coming up. Just follow the link in your schedule. It's literally coming up within 
days to weeks of, of the recording of this. If you follow that link, you'll be able to join us. You get to see really what's it like to feel. We go through process where I, I show you about the insidious nature of trauma and then I guide you into a neural exercise where you're connecting with your inner child and then you're doing breath work where you're actually able to move through those energies, move through those emotions that you've been holding on to through the pandemic, through your transition that's been causing you stress and anxiety or actually able to move through it. And of course, the overview experience is all part of our Cycle Breakers community where I teach you how to unpack a trigger Make sure you subscribe. And to master the two projections that happen every time you get triggered so that you can master self-regulation, nervous system regulation, and build trust in yourself. So follow the links below and we'll see you at the next perfect time.